This session, um, we're gonna, we are lucky to have uh, Kaylee Gash talk to us about mycorrhizal fungi, uh, something near and dear to my heart. I've always kind of enjoyed those arbuscular, vesicular, arbuscular uh, little critters. So I'm glad to hear about them. Uh, Kaylee is an assistant professor, assist, excuse me, assistant professor of soil health research at North Dakota State University. She's a native of Wyoming, got her PhD in ecology and statistics at the University of Wyoming. And her primary responsibilities in her current job is to teach soil ecology and nutrient cycling, cycling courses to undergraduate and graduate students, conduct research on soil health. Her current focus areas are understanding and managing saline soils, plant soil interactions and how management influences soil properties. What a way to start the morning. Well, I guess you've already been at it for a little while, but um, it's a pleasure to be with you today to share um, information about one of my favorite soil organism groups. So I think that uh, mycorrhizal fungi are a very captivating uh, group of soil organisms, and they're probably one of the reasons why I ended up going into soil ecology in the first place. So um, a topic also near and dear to my heart. Um, so today I just want to provide kind of an overview of what these things are and what they do um, and how they might you know, influence crop production, um, some different management considerations. And uh, I've tried to kind of structure this talk around a lot of the questions that I usually get because um, people might be exposed to this idea of mycorrhizal fungi, but um, that's as far as it goes. And so there are always a lot of questions. So if you have additional questions, keep them coming uh, through the Q&A and hopefully uh, we'll have plenty of time to get to them um, at the end. So let's dive in. Okay, so what is this, um, this organism all about? Um, so this is a fungus that, it's a, it's a group of many different species of fungi that live in the soil and they associate with plant roots. And um, and so the actual term mycorrhiza means fungus root, and it's a symbiosis, so it's beneficial to both the plant and to the fungal partner. Um, and there's a kind of economical exchange, there's an agreement or a, a deal so that, that both the plant and the fungus benefit. So we know that plants are primary producers, they take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and turn that into sugars that they then use for building more plant biomass and conducting their metabolism. Um, but, um, and that's, that's the route that carbon gets from the atmosphere into plant biomass and primary production. Um, and so these fungi associate with the plant roots of these, of these photosynthesizers and the fungi need carbon uh, to support the growth of their biomass and also their metabolic functions. And so the plant makes a deal with the fungus and starts to allocate uh, a lot of its sugar to the, the mycorrhizal fun fungus um, to feed it. And so uh, up to 20% of photosynthate or uh, carbon dioxide that can be fixed into plant, plant tissues can be allocated to the fungus. And so that's a big cost and it has to be worth it for the plant. So, uh, so the fungus in exchange for that, um, it interacts with the plant roots in, in very close contact, very intimate structures within the, the plant root cortex cells uh, where that exchange of carbon happens. And then they also have hyphae that extend out into the soil. And so that's what you're looking at, at the left, on the left side of this slide. Um, the black roots are, are, are belonging to the plant system. And then this um, kind of tan colored um, stringy mess is representing the hyphae, uh, the fungal biomass that go out and explore the soil. We call those the extra matrical hyphae uh, because they're outside of the root and they're scavenging for nutrients. And um, so this image on the right is just kind of a microscope image of some small roots. These are maybe about a millimeter in diameter. Um, and then you'll see some kind of much finer, they look like root hairs, uh, but they're mycorrhizal fungi. And so you can see that the diameter of the hyphae is much smaller than those roots. Um, and it grows a lot faster. Fungi are very prolific. And so 
those fungi can explore kind of nooks and crannies of the soil that are inaccessible to the roots. And they expand that zone of nutrient depletion well beyond what the root can do on its own. So there's this deal. It's a, it's a, it has to be, you know, a benefit for each, the plant and the, the, the fungus. And there's an exchange for carbon from the plant um, in exchange for enhanced nu nutrition uh, provided by the fungus. So the fungus will scavenge phosphorus, nitrogen, uh, any kind of nutrient, and then it'll transmit it through its hyphae and, and give it back to the plant. So that's the deal. And um, there are a lot of different fungi that form these types of relationships. Um, and we're gonna just kind of focus on my, our muscular mycorrhizal fungi today, our AM fungi. Um, there are lots of other groups of mycorrhizal fungi, but they typically associate with um, like conifer trees or a lot of shrubby, uh, woody, uh, um, um, plants that occur in like shrublands and natural lands. And so we're, we're just not going to uh, talk about them today because they're not necessarily common in cropping systems. Um, so just a note on terminology, I'll refer to these things as AM fungi just for um, simplicity. And back in the day before we knew a whole lot about the morphology and anatomy of these things, we would call them vesicular arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi or VAM fungi. So if you're, if you're doing some research on your own or you encounter that term, just know that they're the same thing. The, the AM fungi and the VAM fungi are, uh, are the same groups of fungi that associate with a lot of crops um, and, and grass species that we're going to talk about today. So, um, so this little figure on the left is kind of showing you some of the anatomy, um, these hyphae that grow into and interact with those root cortical cells of the host plant. They produce these tree-like structures called, called arbuscules. Um, and that's the point of exchange of nutrients, carbon from the, from the plant to the fungus and nutrients from the fungus to the plant. And then they extend their hyphae out. They also have these kind of round structures inside of the um, plant root that are storage structures called vesicles. And so they store any kind of carbon, uh, carbohydrate excess maybe for a rainy day um, for the fungus to use later on. And then they also produce spores, of course, like most fungi, so that they can uh, propagate and um, withstand periods of, of um, difficult conditions when the, the hyphae can't survive on their own. So those spores are kind of a way to carry them through from season to season. Um, on the right here is just another kind of cross section, same kind of idea with the depiction of these different structures. Um, but just know that those fungi grow into very intimate contact with the root cortical cells and that's where the magic happens. Um, but then those hyphae also extend out beyond the root um, into the soil. So here are just some images to give you an idea of what this might look like in real life. Um, in order to detect mycorrhizal fungi in roots, we kind of use some old fashioned methods. We have to um, subject the roots to kind of a, a harsh stain to remove any kind of um, pigment from the root and make it completely transparent and clear. And then we treat it with a blue stain that attaches to those fungal tissues. And so this image on the left is a root that doesn't have any mycorrhizal fungi in it. Um, and then the image on the right, uh, you can see the dark blue color and the dark blue structures um, in these root cortical cells, as well as the hyphae that are extending out beyond the root. And that is, uh, that's how we quantify and, and screen for mycorrhizal fungi in roots. So in addition to those hyphae, there are all these other structures that we can look for. And if you're really into mycorrhizae, you can analyze these structures with a really fancy microscope to understand which species are infecting the roots. And that gives you a little bit more um, detail about what kinds of species are associating with what kinds of host plants. Um, that's not something that we spend a lot of time doing when we're just screening. Typically, we're just looking for what kinds of um, infection rates um, do we see. And, um, and, and what you're looking at here are, are just some images of arbuscules. The really rounded um, kind of oblong shapes are, are vesicles. And then, uh, and then the hyphae that kind of intermingle within the root cells. So it's very labor intensive to screen roots for mycorrhizal fungi. 
So this whole association allows the plant to acquire nutrients from a much larger volume of the soil than roots alone. And we call this, you know, the, the, the um, location in the soil where the root meets the soil is called the rhizosphere. And it's a very magical place where all kinds of microbial activity happens. There's a lot of nutrient exchange. There's a lot of chemical warfare between all the different microbes that live because it's a highly competitive environment and they're all trying to eke out a living um, in this like cushy zone, right? Where the root is sloughing off cells and providing a, a mucus environment for them to live. So it's a, a zone of intense activity and, and, and nutrient depletion. And so this mycorrhizal network then allows the plant to again, access um, portions and volumes of the soil that it can't access on, on its own. And so it's got this handy trick for getting nutrients uh, in addition to relying on diffusion, which is usually what a root does on its own. Um, and these fungi are going out and scavenging nutrients. And this is particularly useful for getting phosphorus. So as we know, phosphorus is really immobile in the soil. And um, when, we, when we add it to the soil, it can get locked up. And these mycorrhizal fungi have all kinds of tricks and enzymes to help pull that phosphorus off of that soil matrix, make it available, mobilize it, and then ship it to the plant. So that's a huge advantage for, uh, for plants in, in soils where phosphorus tends to get immo uh, immobilized. So the mycorrhizosphere is sort of this root fungus system um, that expands and extends far beyond, far beyond the rhizosphere alone. So as you can imagine with um, enhanced nutrition, um, better nitrogen nutrition, better phosphorus nutrition, the plant overall ends up being um, having better health or it's more robust. So it can tolerate a lot of additional stresses that it might not be able to if it's in a nutrient depleted state. So uh, mycorrhizal association can oftentimes increase the drought tolerance of plants. Um, and that's a combination of the mycorrhizae scavenging water, but then also um, the enhanced nutrition, just the ability of the plant to uh, have a, enough nutrition to grow a larger root system so it can scavenge water on its own. So multiple kind of direct and indirect effects on, um, on how this association improves uh, drought tolerance. Same thing goes for pathogen or pest resistance. Um, again, a healthier plant can resist those attacks much better. This also goes for herbivory. Um, so if there's a, a, you know, if you have a grazing uh, situation where, um, where livestock or wildlife are grazing off the above ground biomass, again, if you have a really strong nutrient uh, scavenging um, network, then you know, it's much easier for that plant to re rebound after being defoliated. Um, in addition to just the better health of the plant and the better sort of immune ability of the plant, um, there's also just this idea of carrying capacity around the root. So as I mentioned, that rhizosphere is a very busy place in the soil. And if, if the space, if the physical space is occupied by beneficial symbionts like mycorrhizal fungi, there just isn't enough space for pathogens to attack the roots. So it's almost like a, a little army that's kind of physically protecting that space and serving as a barrier to some of these pathogens and pests that could attack the root system. Um, these mycorrhizal fungi can also mediate uptake of toxins. So if you have a, an aluminum problem or some other heavy metal, um, they can actually kind of limit the plant's ability to take up those toxins to toxic levels. And that's, that's kind of another cool benefit. So they've got this really good um, partnership, the, the fungus and the plant, and they obviously know what each other needs or doesn't need in order to survive because they depend on each other so much. Um, something that's been getting a ton of attention lately, as it should, is this idea of communication with other plants. And the mycorrhizal fungi can associate a single hyphal network from an individual mycorrhizal fungus and a single species um, can actually associate with multiple plants. So it can be infecting you know, um, two different plants that are of the same species. It can also be infecting at the same time, two different plants that are different species. 
And plants are very good at communicating with one another as we're learning, whether it's through volatile compounds through the air or through these mycorrhizal networks, but they can actually manufacture compounds um, to warn their neighbors about maybe threats or um, give them a cue, you know, kind of like a growth promotion cue. And we're finding that these mycorrhizal networks are key for this underground um, telephone network between plants, which is pretty amazing. Um, so some plants are, they're obligate in that they require AM fungi to su successfully grow and reproduce. And that becomes really important when we start thinking about, you know, crop species that might be heavily dependent on AM fungi. Um, and there are, you know, a few that are speculated to be so, and I can talk about those in a moment. Um, in addition to the benefits of the plant, so the fungus has to have a host plant. These AM fungi cannot live on their own, except for in kind of dormant spore-like forms or as propagules in the soil. And so the benefit to the fungus is having a host, you know, and getting its carbon um, source because it can't really get that on its own. But then there's also these benefits to the soil and these, these fungal hyphae are really good at binding around soil particles and creating aggregates and strengthening them. They also emit a glycoprotein that's kind of like a glue that holds those aggregates together. And so just the physical binding and the adhesion that they provide really improves aggregation and resistance to erosion and the soil tilth the ability for it to kind of be um, fluffy, but not so fluffy that it's powder um, and really nice kind of environment for lots of soil organisms. And they're really good at helping the, the carbon be, become stable in the soil. So um, as their hyphal masses die, uh, that carbon then can become um, fixed onto the surfaces of clays and soil particles and, and stick around in the soil for a long time. So it just kind of enhances the ability for plants to bring carbon below ground and lock it up in stable form. So this is a very typical scene that you see when um, you're at a trade show um, or you're browsing the, the internet for biological products. Um, you'll see tons and tons of photos of just this growth response difference with and without mycorrhizal. Um, products or sometimes, you know, experimentally, oftentimes we'll sterilize the soil to have a non mycorrhizal control. And um, as you're browsing around, cruising around, you'll always see these kinds of things, as I'm sure you do with uh, other field trials and, and various products. So one question is, uh, what plants actually form this association? Because not all plants do. Most plants do. And, and typically, we kind of think, you know, 90% of plant species will have some kind of mycorrhizal relationship, um, but there are consistently some plant families that don't. And so this is a, a paper that's really quite old, 1983. Um, some of us weren't born by then, some of us were. But um, this is a survey of lots of different plant species across, um, I think it's rangeland in Utah. So not a lot of crop species, <laughs> probably on this list, but there are a lot of weedy species. And I've highlighted some of the families that are, that are very typically non-mycorrhizal. So we see the Amaranthaceae and the Polygonaceae, which I think are combined now. And those are, um, no, I'm sorry, it's the, the Chenopodiaceae and the Amaranthaceae are combined. And those are things like kochia, uh, lamb's quarters, sugar beets, spinach, um, that goosefoot family. So there are a lot of really important weedy species in that family. And um, if you think about that, there's kind of this benefit for invaders to not require mycorrhizae. They kind of, um, they're those, those op opportunists or pioneers who move into disturbed soils. And um, if, if they don't have to require this partnership, then they're at an advantage. They can just kind of be independent and colonize those areas. So it's really interesting that a lot of those weedy species are oftentimes non-mycorrhizal. Another important group that's um, non-mycorrhizal are these brassicas, so the mustard family. And we have a lot of crop species that fall in that family, as well as uh, weedy species. So just to give you a kind of a list of some species that you might be more familiar with, um, here are some non-mycorrhizal hosts. As I mentioned, the goosefoot family, um, kochia, lamb's court, the pigweeds, palmer amaranth, and water hemp, all of those are in this family that typically doesn't associate with mycorrhizal fungi, or they might, you know, form the association, but it's not really that strong or beneficial um, to the plant or to the fungus. 
the mustard family, canola, camelina, radish, rapeseed, pennycress. I mean, if you're into vegetable crops, the whole broccoli, cauliflower, kohlrabi, Brussels sprouts, um, kale, all of those are uh, also non-mycorrhizal. In addition, uh, buckwheats and purslings, which may have some important uh, weedy species and crop species as well. But the good news is that most of our crops, and like I said, most plant species are mycorrhizal and the grasses are, are usually very highly mycorrhizal, which is great news. So corn, wheat, barley, oats, rye, uh, lots of perennial grasses, turf grasses. Um, I have yet to encounter a grass species, weedy or not, that doesn't associate with mycorrhizal fungi. And those fine roots are kind of a really good, it's a really good partnership. Um, just because the, um, the thick tap roots kind of tend to get kind of woody on the outside and, and um, that those structural kind of uh, compounds that, that coat the root to protect it don't really lend themselves well to mycorrhizal infection, as you can imagine. So these fine fibrous root systems have lots of surface area that's fair game for the mycorrhizae. Um, the legume family, for sure, soybeans, peas, alfalfa, dry beans, any of the legume crops um, and cover crops are going to form mycorrhizae. So they kind of have the best of both worlds because they can get their nitrogen from their nitrogen fixers, but then they also have this excellent phosphorus scavenging apparatus as well. Um, so really good for uh, scavenging those nutrients and putting them into biomass. And then, of course, the aster family. Um, even our, our weedy friends like dandelions, um, but sunflower, any other um, aster species typically will have uh, pretty strong mycorrhizal networks. So these are just a few that, you know, few crops or weeds that you may encounter, but just know that the vast majority of plants, um, except for those few families, will associate and form mycorrhizal relationships. Um, so here's a, a little study kind of related to that. This is out of South Dakota from a colleague at ARS, the Agricultural Research Service in Brookings, Michael Lehman. And he's done quite a few surveys related to mycorrhizal fungi and different cover crops. And um, these are just results from three different fields, uh, no-till farms in South Dakota, um, comparing uh, the number of AMF propagules in the soil so that could be spores or little chunks of roots that have hyphae still alive inside of them. And those would be sort of like, you think of it as the seed of the AM fungi. So if it's in there, then it can uh, help develop those networks with once a live host plant is present. And so the, the number of AMF propagules in the soil was much higher when they had a cover crop treatment. And I've, I've added the mix there compared to no cover crop. Um, the real champion in their studies has been oats. They found um, that oats really improve or, or following an oat cover crop, um, they really see a big boost in the mycorrhizal prop propagule numbers. And um, as I mentioned, the grasses are, are highly mycorrhizal and their root systems really lend themselves well to, to that. And um, if you notice, they did include on one of these studies, a canola cover crop, and, and you'll see that that's a very low number of propagules, no different than the control. Um, and again, that uh, makes sense because the, that's a non-mycorrhizal species. So uh, management considerations. Um, AM fungi are common in soils and very good at dispersing. This, this is not something that I worry about a lot in terms of mycorrhizae disappearing from soil. I've looked at a lot of really nasty soils being in the, in the field of soil health and reclamation restoration. And I've, I've, I've yet to find a soil that's completely depleted of some form of, of mycorrhizae. Um, however, management practices and rotations can influence the abundance. So, as I mentioned, AM fungi have to have a plant host, so fallow periods are a little bit rough on them. They have to just survive it as those propagule forms, those dormant forms. And so the, you know, if you're really hoping to help out your mycorrhizae, then um, an advice that I give about so many things is maximize the time and the space that's occupied by a living root. Um, growing a crop of non-mycorrhizal hosts like canola or sugar beet um, can, of course, de deplete those populations. And oftentimes, the fallow syndrome that you see after one of those crops is related to phosphorus nutrition uh, because those mycorrhizal populations are, are depressed. I think Agvice had a really good email about that yesterday. 
and how to deal with that from a phosphorus fertility standpoint. Um, if there is high available phosphorus content in the soil, then it's not worth it for the plant to send all of its carbon to the fungus if it can scavenge enough available phosphorus on its own. So the plant will shut down those mycorrhizal relationships and um, just work on getting the phosphorus on its own. So, um, so you might see a, a slight dip in those populations if you, you know, following a, a high phosphorus uh, fertilizer treatment, or if you just have a soil that um, it keeps a lot of phosphorus available in solution for the plant. Um, there's been a fair amount of work on fungicide application. I know this is a concern. This is a question I get all the time. And we're finding that um, if, you know, if you follow the, the labeled recommendations for applying a fungicide to the soil or to the foliage, um, there's really not any kind of a, a strong or lasting effect on the mycorrhizal communities, which is good news. They're incredibly resilient. And just as a side tip, I, when I do uh, research on mycorrhizal fungi, I have to use a fung fungicidal control. And I treat that control, those soils, every two weeks with fungicide. And I still see, I mean, and I'm dousing the soil with fungicide, and I still see mycorrhizae surviving or growing back in that two-week period. So they're very... Uh, prolific. They're very capable of growing under a variety of conditions. I don't want to say they're indestructible, but uh, they are very resilient, which is, which is good news. Um, physical disturbance, of course, just breaking up the soil. It just rips apart their biomass um, and physically disrupts their bodies. So, um, so that is, of course, detrimental to all fungi in the soil. Also low light conditions, and I mentioned this because of um, interseeding cover crops in, just into a canopy, say it cover crops in a corn canopy. Um, you know, the plant needs that light in order to produce that photosynthate. And if it doesn't have a lot of light, if it's kind of in, you know, really struggling to get that photosynthate, that solar radiation, then again, it's gonna be, you know, that carbon that it does get will be very precious. And so it might shut down those mycorrhizal relationships. I don't think that this is a huge concern for cropping systems, but I did want to mention it um, just because from a carbon economy standpoint, it is kind of interesting to think about. Um, and so in addition to having live roots as, and as much space and time as possible, diverse rotations, of course, prevent a lot of these effects of uh, non-mycorrhizal hosts or, um, um, just various types of root systems that will kind of buffer the system against huge losses of mycorrhizal fungi over time. And just keep in mind that the amount of mycorrhizae in the soil or even infecting a root is not necessarily representing how effective it is. So um, we can't, I guess what that means is that just because a plant is associating with mycorrhizae doesn't mean that it has to have it. And it also doesn't mean that it's going to have higher productivity because of it. So these are very complicated relationships. And there could be you know, many, many species of fungi associated with a single host plant. And that's a lot of economies to be juggling. And so just because we have these numbers in the soil and they're infecting roots doesn't necessarily mean that you'll get a boost in productivity in the crop. Um, there are lots of exceptions where that doesn't happen. So another question that I get oftentimes is how do I know if I have these things in my soil? And I'll say again, AM fungi are common in soils and very good at dispersing. Um, but there are some tests that you can order from commercial labs. This isn't something that I recommend all the time. Um, I got in trouble for saying this a few weeks ago, but I, I encourage people to have faith that they're there um, just because they are very common and they're very good at dispersing. Um, but you can certainly um, send samples of roots or soil to labs to have them quantified for mycorrhizae using different methods. Um, it's definitely, you know, I've offered to do that in the past. I'm not a service lab. I'm a research lab on campus. But if you need that peace of mind just to know that you have some in your soils or your client soils, um, get in touch with me and, and we'll figure out a way to get you some, some good data about that. So should I use inoculants? I think this is the last most popular question I get. Um, I'll say it again, AM fungi are common in soils and very good at dispersing. Um, so there, there's not a whole lot of consistent evidence that inoculants for mycorrhizal fungi work, uh, much like a lot of the other biological amendments. And so if you're curious about a particular product or just wanna 
check out some of the research that's out there, whether it's published or research reports through extension service. I highly recommend this um, Iowa State University compendium on uh, various different products that are being used for crop production or um, that are out there. And, and so I did this search this morning and there were 21 articles that came up that you could browse through to see you know, the effects of mycorrhizal fungi on, um, on crop production. So I think I'm right out of time. Um, thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.